Okay, so my name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester based at Cornell University, and I host the monthly Forest Connect webinar series. And it's my pleasure to have a repeat presenter. Kimberly Bone is a forestry extension educator and specialist. They, um, she's done a lot of work, especially with invasive plants and forest health issues. And she's going to, she's going to give a fuller introduction of herself. Um, but today she's going to be talking about how to manage your forest in the presence of emerald ash borer, which is a big deal for a lot of us. So Kimberly, I'm going to mute my microphone and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. All right, thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone, for joining me uh, during your lunchtime. Um, so as Peter mentioned, I'm a forestry edu extension educator with Penn State uh, in the northern part of Pennsylvania, um, and I have a, actually a background in my graduate degrees in forest resource management and specifically in silviculture from the State University of New York. Uh, and Actually, after that, spent some time in Florida. I worked for the University of Florida and became very interested in invasive plants and forest health issues down there. But I missed my northern hardwoods and my mountains, so I had to come back. Um, so I'll be talking today, as Peter mentioned, about managing your forests in the, in the face of our emerald ash borer threats. Uh, and just as an overview of what I'll be talking about today, uh, I'll start with a little bit about basic ID and signs of emerald ash borer in your forest, and then primarily be talking about those silvicultural options for managing forests before, at the initial stages and after in, uh, infestation and, and potential ash mortality. And with particular emphasis actually on the before stage is what you can do to manage your forest before emerald ash borer hits. Um, I'll also just briefly touch on some integration of chemical controls and bi biological controls to control the emerald ash borer itself. I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of detail on those, um, particularly with the biological controls. I'll save that for the ent entomologist. But I do want to touch on some treatments that are actually being integrated with silvicultural activities. So that's what I'll, I'll go over. This is the map I was talking about, Peter, that I wanted to show. Um, this is actually from the Emerald Ash Borer Information Network. They have a really great website with lots of useful information and this wonderful map that really shows um, by county throughout the northeastern United States and Canada when emerald ash borer has been detected. So I'm sure most of you know it was first detected in Michigan in the Detroit area um, and the Ontario region in 2002. Um, has since spread in 2006. It was first detected in Chicago. We first saw it in Pennsylvania in 2008. Um, about 2010 were first evidence in New York State and now you can see in the purple, so that's the most recent sightings, we have seen it now detected all the way up in Vermont and as far north now as um, into the upper reaches of Maine as well. Um, this did get actually cut off the screen, but there are some detections now in the southern portions of the Appalachians, so sort of the um, below sort of that Tennessee area as well. And there is a wide range of um, spread rates for, for emerald ash borer that have been detected. Uh, and just, some, just that range of, of spread goes from maybe one to two miles a year um, to as much as six, or six to eight miles per year uh, in these heavily infested areas. And that's just the natural movement and the natural progression of the emerald ash borer. And of course, we have all of, um, other concerns with people moving emerald ash borer as well. I think, Peter, you mentioned too, this sudden increase in particularly seeing emerald ash borer mortality now. And I think that really goes to a lot of time, you know, a lot of what we see with invasive insects is you have that exponential buildup of a population and then a real sudden change in, in potential ash mortality. 
So emerald ash borer does affect all of the northern uh, North American ash trees, um, but it particularly affects white ash trees. And of course, for some people, this is important because of uh, baseball. If you like baseball, you know that um, baseball bats were primarily made with ash wood. They're one of the, the harder woods. Um, and that's actually had a pretty significant effect on the baseball bat industry um, with impacts to emerald ash borer. It also has a pretty significant effect on green ash, which we have in this area as well, and also black ash. Black ash is a wetland species, and it's actually very important culturally for a lot of Native American uh, peoples, and it's often used in their basketry. And so this has a pr had a pretty significant effect um, culturally as well. There has also been at least one case of the emerald ash borer moving onto and infesting something that is non-ash, and that is the white fringe tree. Um, I'm not sure if this is quite the best pictures of, of that. Um, this is not maybe typical something we typically see in a in the natural forest setting. I think this is more of an ornamental, but again, a little bit of evidence that perhaps there are there could and potentially in the future be additional host trees. I'm sure you all know what an emerald ash borer looks like, but I would be remiss if I didn't put a picture of this in there. It is, is a pretty green bug. Um, it's about a half inch long and an eight, eighth inch wide. Um, so you can see sort of relative to a penny what the scale of that emerald ash borer looks like. And this is what the larvae looks like, so at the different stages of the instar and, and, and um, sizes. And I did actually want to put this up and put this up as a reminder to really look at the, the shape of the, um, the different segments of this larvae. So you can see from the, um, this emerald ash borer picture, the larvae segments are what I would describe as somewhat bell-shaped. Um, and this is important because there actually are some native ash borers in the Northeast, and they have a very different um, shape to the to the segments. Those tend to be a little bit more rectangular and don't have that that sort of nice bell-shaped segment. So that would be a good indicator, a good way to differentiate between the invasive non-native emerald ash borer and other native ash borers. And then, of course, this is what um, the boring looks like on the inside of the wood. It has the, the, the larvae make this sort of S-shaped uh, curve um, as they're feeding through the phloem of the tree. And as they emerge, they create actually what's described as a D-shaped hole. You can see that on, on the picture on the right. Um, uh, this is a fantastic picture I found from Bugwood. I'm not sure if these are photoshopped or, or for real, maybe they, with a time camera, but there you can see the, the emergence of the emerald ash borer in that D-shaped hole. And that's another key characteristic of the emerald ash borer com compared to maybe some of the other natural insects that we have in the forest. So that, that nice sort of D-shaped um, exit hole. In reality, you're probably not likely to see the actual insect um, and not really see the larvae itself either until after um, it's, a tree is down and it's too late and you see that evidence of the, the larvae, uh, the, that S-shaped curve. Um, so what you are more likely to see is evidence on the, the outside of the ash tree that will indicate that you have an emerald ash borer infestation. And one of the first signs is this bark flaking. So that's just a really typical sign of emerald ash borer infestations. On the left, you see sort of that's really at an early stage, just a little bit of the bark deflakes, but you see on the right side that right uh, picture, as the, as the infestation progresses, you really lose more and more of the bark. It becomes very obvious at that point. Um, and I do want to mention that actually the emerald ash borer will lay its eggs and, and the, the, the larvae can in, even infest trees as small as one to two inches in diameter. Um, so it really affects the whole range of tree sizes of ash trees in your forest, even these smaller saplings. Another good 
indicator that you have emerald ash borer is if you see a significant increase in woodpecker holes. Um, and here you can see a picture of both sort of that flaking bark effect as well as the woodpecker holes. Um, obviously the woodpeckers are going after the emerald ash borer larvae. And in fact, actually they, there has been some some measurements about how significantly woodpeckers will affect the, the, uh, the ash borer population. Not really that much, but they will actually consume about 20 to 30% of the uh, emerald ash borer population if you have a healthy woodpecker population in your area. This is another um, key sign too, and sometimes you'll actually see this before the bark flaking, and that's you see increased evidence of epicormic branching. Um, so just epicormic branches just means, as you can see in this picture, the development of these little side branches, living side branches out of the main bowl or trunk of the tree. Um, here And here you can see pictures um, of trees in an urban setting or a suburban setting. Um, but the, the same is true for um, trees in more of a forest landscape as well. You'll, you'll start to see this epicormic branches and that's a real key sign also of emerald ash borer. And then over time, as the infestation progresses, you'll see um, this progression of dieback in the crown. So the, the adults do feed on the leaves and defoliate the crown, um, as well as that defoliation you get just from that, um, the poor health of the tree that, and that the changes in health of that tree. Uh, there is some indications and, and some suggestions on the insecticide aspect that if you see a tree with more than 50% crown dieback, um, that it, the insecticide treatments that are recommended to control emerald ash borer actually won't be effective in helping that tree to recover. So that's sort of a, a threshold point at which the insecticides are no longer useful for um, at least helping the tree to, to recover. You can control the emerald ash borer on that tree, but you, you might have some, you're likely to have some significant mortality. And we do see tree mort mortality after an uh, emerald ash borer infestation in as little as one to two years. That's probably on the really short side. Um, the study by Knight and all looked at sort of that range and tree, tree mortality post infestation or um, invasion. Um, and one to two was sort of the, the, the low end, but it can be as much as five uh, up to five years, depending again on sort of the level inf of infestation and how much damage there is. So it can happen pretty quickly. And I think a lot of us actually have been seeing it on the lower end. So that the mortality occurring pretty quickly after emerald ash borer has made a significant appearance. And this is one of the hazards actually. Not only do you have mortality of ash trees, but the ash actually um, becomes very brittle very quickly. So this is just a, a photo I took out in uh, one of the state forests that sort of a, that example of how brittle this the, the wood becomes and it's so it's called ash snap really because it's very brittle, um, breaks very easily um, and sometimes very unpredictably. So those are some key signs. Um, of when you have an uh, ash borer uh, infestation in your area. And what I wanted to talk about first is some silvicultural options really at the pre-infestation stage. So what do you do before you actually have emerald ash borer in your specific stand, but perhaps you know it's in the area. And so I'm gonna talk a lot about these quote, pre-salvage harvest activities. I think that's what, um, I'm hearing a lot of people talking about doing, and I put pre-salvage in quotes because I'm not sure if it's a legitimate uh, silvicultural term, um, but it really does get to that, ter uh, that idea, that concept that we're salvaging the ash, in this case, before the mortality sets in instead of after. Uh, and along with this, then, I'll talk about, again, some of those integrated approaches, perhaps harvesting some ash and then saving others with the insecticides. 
So again, just to reiterate what I, I mentioned a few slides ago, we do these pre-salvage to remove ash be before a significant EAB population builds up and before we have that ash mortality. And there's really a number of reasons um, for doing these pre-salvage operations. And this is one thing I recommend for a lot of people, if you, are, if you don't have emerald ash borer yet, if you know it's near you, you know it's coming, is to really start thinking ahead about and planning, a, a really thinking what are you gonna do with your ash? Because it does, as we, we've talked about, it can come in quickly, the mortality does happen quickly. Um, and, not, and it's important to do these pre-salvages, not just to recover the timber. That's a, of course, a lot of people are, are concerned about um, the potential timber loss, but there is a, significant safety issue also with this ash snap. Um, so if you are working on a public land or a land that's available for recreation to, and people to come on and maybe even hunters to come on and there is some potential liability in terms of that ash snap just happening, um, it's really important to think about this pre-salvage operation just in even in terms of that safety component. I would also say on the logger side of things, it's really important to think about doing this before you have the significant mortality because this obviously is a significant safety hazard for loggers as well. And unfortunately, we have had a few casualties from ash snap um, in the Pennsylvania area um, and we, we're at a point actually now where loggers won't even go into and do any work in an area where the ash has already died just because of that concern. So again, it's important to do your pre-planning now and, and really think about uh, what you could potentially do. A couple other considerations too, and this is primarily on the private landowner side, perhaps, or if you're working with a smaller acreage, is that, if you're doing a pre-salvage of ash, you're really not likely to have enough ash to do an economically viable pre-salvage harvest, you know, it's sort of an ash-only harvest. And of course, I always tell this, I, it's a, a constant reminder to my private landowners about avoiding these, quote, selective cuts. So don't just cut all the other big trees out to make this salvage operation, you know, economical. Um, think about, again, incorporating it into a silvicultural treatment that really does focus on the future of the forest, whether it's the, the residual trees or the regeneration. So some of those silvicultural options for that pre-salvage treatment then would be something like an intermediate treatment, such as a timber stand improvement, um, where here the focus is really on um, the remaining mature trees. So how do you focus sunlight and nutrients onto those rema remaining mature trees that are still desirable, but not ash? Um, or think about um, a final harvest or a regeneration me method to initiate the next forest. So to really focus that, that treatment on the regeneration of the next forest. Um, and if any, any of you have listened in on my webinars on degraded forests, you'll see that the philosophy and the approach is very similar. And, and it is a similar approach to thinking about forest management, whether it's degraded from humans and high grading or whether it's degraded from insects or disease. Um, and so that's, that's really think about where your, your forest is moving um, and, and uh, the types of treatments that would best promote either the mature trees or that next regeneration. And you can, uh, um, as I've mentioned in other webinars, base that decision on some quantifiable stocking and spatial distribution of the ash in your stand. Now again, for the private landowners, I, I often ask them to first think about the qualitative um, uh, questions too and qualitative effects. A lot of times they're walking out in, in their forest and trying to assess what they really should do. And just some of those questions, again, on the qualitative side are, are just thinking about, you know, envision removing the ash, just the ash. How much overstory will there, will there be? Are you removing a significant component of the overstory or is it um, just a very small portion? 
And think about then how that changes light levels to the floor. So does it increase light so much that you would spark an understory uh, response? Uh, you know, what is the, the potential for either desirable regeneration or maybe not so desirable competing vegetation? So don't just look at your overstory too. Look at what's in the understory and the potential for things to respond. And said maybe another way, getting maybe a little bit more quantitative is, you know, are the ash few and scattered? So like in this picture, do you have a single tree opening where the remaining overstory canopy can fill in and, and, and shade out um, the understory? Um, or sometimes you have, you have a few ash, but they're all clustered. So think about the type of opening that would happen with removing a cluster of ash. So here you have maybe a, a, a middle ground scenario where you have um, regeneration or understory initiation in small clusters across your stand, but maybe not whole scale. And obviously on the far end then is, it, is the ash a significant portion of your stand. So here you might think about a regeneration method. On the more quantitative side of things, um, th these are just some recommendations from Pennsylvania. So both of both our state um, Department of Conservation and Natural Resource and actually also our national forests are tending more on the regeneration method as uh, an option for their salvaging their ash. So they actually are recommending a, a regeneration me method if the ash is even just over 25% of the total basal area of the stand. And so that's actually not a terribly big component of the stand, if it's right at that 25 or 30% mark. Um, but they are using that as their lower threshold uh, for considering a regeneration method. I've read other recommendations that are maybe a little bit more conservative that say if the relative density is reduced to no less than 50% uh, of the stocking and has a potential to grow. So you have to have some good trees to, to grow back in a 10 year period. Um, then you could, you could still opt with something that would be more of an intermediate treatment. So those of you uh, from who, who took forestry and silviculture, you can see this just a little bit of a reminder. Again, when I talk about relative density or relative stocking, um, that's really that relationship between the numbers of trees and their sizes. So either, either their average diameters or the basal area of that stand, which will help you to determine um, if when you do a cutting, the stocking is too low to really re recreate that overstory canopy. So just talking a little bit now in, in more detail about uh, the pre-salvage operations in relation to maybe an intermediate treatment or a timber stand improvement is that these could be thought about being done in conjunction with either uh, a traditional thinning or a crop tree release. And I've seen this a lot. Actually, a lot of our um, forests in Pennsylvania have been uh, treated uh, with a traditional thinning. Um, and so in that context, essentially what you're doing is you are removing the ash um, regardless of the size. Um, but within the rest of the forest, particularly if you, if you don't have a significant component of ash, is that you want to also then to make that a more economical treatment is do perhaps a thin from below, and it can be a, a heavy thin from below to get perhaps some of those intermediate canopy position trees. But also, you know, while you're taking out the ash, think about improving the health in general of the forest. So reducing some of the other trees of other species um, that are maybe in poor form or poor health already for other reasons, and trying to promote growth on some of the desirable non-ash species uh, that are still in your forest and are perhaps in, in those co-dominant and dominant positions, and that would uh, improve from increased light. The other option I, I recommend is more of a crop tree release, and this I would say is more for maybe a smaller private landowner or a smaller acreage, or maybe perhaps a property where you don't have the best um, forest health conditions in general, and there may be only, you know, a few 
what you would call crop trees that you think can per, um, perform and that are desirable for the future. And so in this case, what I sort of recommend is that, you know, look for that crop tree that maybe is near the ash tree that, that you would need to remove. So a t traditional crop tree release, we always recommend freeing at one to two, and usually at least two sides of a selected codominant or dominant crop tree. Um, and so perhaps one of those sides is where you have one of those ash that you need to remove. So again, this perhaps maybe not may not be as economical as sort of a traditional thinning, um, but could be an option in some smaller acreages again, or, or um, areas where perhaps a thinning uh, would not be justified. Uh, just a reminder though, of course, with both of these, uh, it is easy to get carried away. Um, and so, <laughs> so I always remind people that when you're doing a sort of a crop tree release or a thinning that you don't want to remove more than 30% of that stand, stand stocking or else you are really moving into more of a, uh, a regeneration method and have potential to really release some understory species. So it's mostly problematic if they're undesirable, of course. And I did, so here I do want to talk a little bit about considerations for integ integrating now the insecticide control with timber stand improvements, um, either a thinning or a crop tree release. And I think we tend to think about using the insecticides, um, saving, saving the large ash more on maybe a, in a residential or community um, co context or perhaps a state park. Um, but I actually have heard of the, um, even our state forest now, trying to integrate this with some of their harvesting. Um, and really it comes down to thinking about what is the economic cost, obviously, to treat these individual trees. It's, it's not cheap. Um, and, but compare that, maybe think about that in terms of being able to still offset with offset that cost with some revenue that could be generated from this this pre-salvage treatment uh, and i will just make a note too there are a number of emerald ash borer calculators out there on the website and actually purdue has a pretty good one um, I haven't explored it that thoroughly, but a lot of times, just be warned, I, with those calculators, they're usually doing a trade-off between the cost of the insecticide treatment versus the cost of cutting it down, cutting the tree down. So obviously, in an urban or a, land, a landscape uh, scenario, you're really going to have a cost to cut the, the, uh, the ash trees down, whereas more in the forest management context, we're thinking about actually being able to try and generate some revenue from cutting the tree down. So you do still have to, to offset those two components, those, those two economic components. But I would also add, and particularly maybe on a, on a state forest or a state park or a nature preserve, that there is some ecological or social benefit and social benefit to retaining some of those large ashes. So there, perhaps there is a, um, a non-economic value to to retaining that ash or, or there it's worth the, the the cost of the investment to, to do some of those individual treatments to keep some ash just from a social perspective particularly another consideration for for thinking about this obviously is the scale of operability um, if you're working on a property that's a thousand acres are you really going to be able to invest in even treating a small population of the ash in your stand? And how would you do that? So you might consider either doing, maybe perhaps partitioning off a small portion of that entire stand um, to treat uh, with insecticides to retain that ash component, or perhaps thinking about scattering those insecticide treatments across the entire stand. So obviously that, um, is a little bit more labor friendly if you're working on a small property, but there is some benefit ecologically to maybe perhaps scattering that those insecticide treatments across across the stand so that you can perhaps have some ash regeneration and at least an ash overstory in the future. 
I also just recently read a study that looked at very localized areas and small scale um, insecticide treatments of even just a portion of the ash in an area. And they did this, this study by Mercator and all actually did find that even treating some of the ash does actually slow the population expansion into outlier regions. And so that could be another consideration for you in terms of the long-term sort of, you know, forest management is that, do we need to consider maybe doing some of these insecticide treatments particularly if we're near one of those outlier regions, to at least slow down the ash movement, um, which could then actually facilitate the ability to do some of this other pre-salvage harvest operations in another area. So it gives you a little bit bigger window. And I would say too, in terms of this pre-salvage operations, is, and this is what we've seen in, in my part of Pennsylvania is that, um, all of a sudden people got really nervous uh, with good reason and our forest consultants and our loggers actually got a little bit overwhelmed by by the amount of work that happened uh, or that was available um, so we actually were lucky that the markets the markets are still really good for ash but we had a lot of our private landowners almost on a waiting list to have their their trees harvested um, so that could be a consideration in, in terms of doing some insecticide control. Probably, if you, you know, working a little bit more across the landscape is that perhaps that gives you just a little bit bigger window to get all of this pre-salvage operations done. Uh, and just a couple slides on the types of treatments. Again, the, these fir this first slide would probably be more for the, the private landowner. Um, these are more um, user friendly. So either a basal bark uh, application with uh, Dino Tefuron, or what most private landowners do is, is the soil drench with uh, imidative cloprid either in the spring or fall. And I will say up front too, this depends on what state you're living in. So in Pennsylvania, um, at least the imidacloprid is not restricted, so a, a homeowner can purchase this and use this on their property. I know in some other states it's actually restricted, so it's not always an option for all homeowners, but sort of an easier method. Uh, it does take about two years for both of these methods to really be effective in terms of controlling the emerald ash borer population, and it does require repeated application every year. The other option is probably what's being uh, used more at the landscape or landscape level or more on the professional side is the stem injection. Uh, there are a number of different chemicals that can be used for stem injections and in most places, I think most states, this, is, this does require a certified professional. Um, and these, these treatments are more expensive obviously, but they actually last a little bit longer. So I know with some of the chemicals, you can actually have good control for between two to three years. So it's sort of worth the cost of the investment in, in, in that sense. So that's all I'll say about um, the insecticide parts. Uh, I'll switch a little bit now to the uh, thinking about a regeneration method. Now, Again, if you have some, you have a pretty significant ash component, or it's worthwhile to think about regenerating the forest. These are the two options, the two even age options. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on these. Uh, I will make a plug for another webinar I have that on even age methods. If you're interested in learning about even age silviculture, that. Um, it's on the Center for Private Forests uh, with Penn State. Uh, but I will just say a couple things in terms of trying to decide which, perhaps which regeneration method you're interested in. With clear cuts, obviously, particularly with northern hardwoods, um, it's really important to think about having some advanced regeneration uh, before obviously removing all of your trees. Um, and this would be a better approach if you have a significant proportion of shade intolerant species that you're interested in regenerating. Whereas a shelterwood method, you really, as the name suggests, you're sort of sheltering the, the landscape, the, the forest, with some residual large trees. And those residual large trees during a seed cut would provide 
the seed source for your next seed crop. And, and a lot of times is really useful for shade tolerant species as well. So you have to think a little bit about what your current composition is and what you would want in the future as well. There is also an opportunity to think about uneven aged forests with some of these ash salvages. And in fact, this is a picture from Wisconsin, um, a case study from Wisconsin, where they are using that as a quote, opportunity to convert an even aged forest to an uneven aged northern hardwood forest. And so, as I mentioned previously, sometimes you do find those ashen clusters. And so that is a nice, um, maybe opportunity to create a group opening um, or several group openings throughout the forest to get that initial age class developed. And then within the rest of the matrix of the forest, perhaps where ash is not clustered, you would think about obviously still removing, removing most of that ash component um, and doing that sort of that timber stand improvement throughout the rest of the matrix of the forest to, to promote the the remaining residual trees. So there are many opportunities to, to think about how you can perhaps restructure your forest. And the next topic I wanna talk, talk about is sort of that, what do you do now within that post salvage phase or maybe even in that post infestation phase where you have had some mortality um, and think about what your forest is gonna look like with or without that ash. So I do want to focus on, focus on that regeneration, sort of that next forest. Um, and here talk a little bit more too about um, how we can integrate maybe biocontrols into that. So I do actually get a lot of questions about this, like what, what kind of regeneration should we be focusing on in the aftermath of emerald ash borer? Um, and there are a lot of different questions I get and suggestions too. And, and obviously an easy one would be to focus on other existing desirable species. So we do, most of our forests hopefully do have other desirable species that we can focus our, our efforts on to make sure that those really establish. Uh, I've also been asked and I've been hearing a lot more frequently about is this uh, underplanting. So is there an ash quote replacement that we can do some underplanting with if we're going to do some harvesting and particularly some regeneration methods? Um, we're doing a lot of this actually or thinking a lot about this with hemlock in in Pennsylvania and our areas. You know what is really a suitable replacement species for hemlock and so this has been coming up with ash as well. Another question is, uh, you know, what about the existing ash? And I've seen this all over my area, at least, is actually I've seen some pretty significant ash regeneration in the last year, or maybe last two years, in fact. Um, and some of it looks pretty good. It's, you know, it's getting in, into that sort of sapling size stage already. And, and it seems to be pretty abundant. So I have been getting questions about that as well. Uh, and then finally, what do we do with the resistant ash? So there's a lot of interested, interest in, in what we call this resistant ash, ash large ash trees that have actually survived um, and withstood emerald ash borer infestations. Um, and is there any potential for genetic breeding? So I'm gonna talk about a couple of those ideas in the next slides here. So in terms of underplanting, Actually, there hasn't been too much done um, in terms of trying to really think about what's the best replacement for ash. I mean, I, I think just like with hemlock is that you really can't replace an individual species. Uh, but there are some things that maybe could be good complements or um, additions that maybe is a fairly decent substitute. Um, and I did actually find one case study that was really looking at underplanting after ash salvage. This happened to be within a black, black ash wetlands in Minnesota, so it might not apply to everybody in terms of the wetland context, but you could think about maybe some similar categories of species. And, and what they looked at was first, obviously other native trees to the region. So they, they, t they underplanted red maple, American elm, uh, balsam poplar and eastern larch, these were all native to the area and sort of native to those wetland ecosystems. But they also 
uh, tried some potential climate change adapters. So they were interested in looking at other species as a potential response per perhaps to climate change. And so they selected two species that were from the lower, uh, I guess the, the, the next lowest climate region for the area. And so they selected hackberry and swamp white oak um, as their climate adapters. And they, then they also selected a non-native ash, and you'll hear a little bit more about this when I talk about the resistant trees. Uh, Manchurian ash is an Asian ash, and it is resistant to the emerald ash borer. So they also tried this as, as a pr potential substitute. Uh, and I don't expect you to read all of this uh, on this slide. Um, uh, just briefly want to like share the results uh, with, with you and basically they did look at different time types of salvages so they looked at a clear cut they looked at basically just girdling the ash so an ash only removal which you could think about as sort of that intermediate you know um, thinning and then a group selection cut and basically what they found was that particularly the 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 new species, the climate adapters and the non-native ash, they actually showed some pretty good survival, but they had really slow growth compared to some of the other species. They, in terms of height growth and, and, and diameter growth, um, no matter what the, the salvage treatment was, they were really, those were really on the low end of the height growth and at best, perhaps comparable to some of the native shade tolerant species. So this is a preliminary uh, results basically. I think these are three year results. So it wasn't surprising that in terms of the height growth, the shade intolerant species had the, the higher height growth, but um, the, at least the shade intolerant native species. So again, a couple of op or different options to think about. Another question comes up about, as I mentioned, what about that advanced ash regeneration that we're seeing all over our forest? Is there any hope? That's, I get that a lot. Um, and here I would say actually there may be a small glimmer of hope. So I did mention that emerald ash borer trees do infest you know, small saplings one to two inches. And so that obviously gives a lot of people some pause for concern. Uh, but there has been a recent study um, looking at how biocontrols are helping to protect regeneration. Um, so these are just the pictures of the four biocontrols now that are, are being released and tested in the northeastern uh, part of the United States, and I think also in Canada as well. I'm not going to go into much detail about the insects themselves, except that they are uh, parasitoids. Uh, but um, one of the studies that I have just recently read is looking at not really just the, the control uh, on large ash trees, but what it does to small trees or what, what's the, the predation on small trees. And so this is my little glimmer of hope with our, with our ash regeneration. I looked over time at uh, plots where the, this particular biocontrol was released versus the non-release plots. And by the third year, you can see that there is a significant improvement in the predation of, of um, the emerald ash borer larvae by this paratisoid. So it's, it, it, it removes almost up to, I think it's a little bit more than 80% of the, the larvae on those one to two inch trees. Now again, this is really in the preliminary stages. So how those one to two inch trees will still recover and develop into um, larger sapling classes is, is yet to be determined, but it is my little glimmer of hope here um, that, you know, it might be worth um, even trying to perhaps promote some ash regeneration when we're doing some of these salvage operations. So if you're doing a shelter wood method, you know, you can still try to promote some of the natural ash regeneration, not just focus on other species. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, resistant trees. And this is actually a picture I took, again, in my local state forest. If you can see sort of in the background, there is a pretty much almost 
dead ash tree or it's on its way it's out it's probably 90 percent dead uh but in the foreground you see a nice healthy ash tree and it and like beech bark disease there is about one to two percent of the population of ash trees that seem to be resistant to the emerald ash borer uh, and just very 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 generally in one sentence um, what I can pre uh, or uh, sort of read from from most of the literature is that really what makes the trees resistant is or these resistant trees is that they have this unique bark chemistry that's not palatable to the emerald ash borer and this citation here I have below actually is a really nice review paper of what we know and knowledge gaps about resistant ash. Um, so I would just say in terms of resistant trees is that when we're thinking about pre-salvage operations is that really not likely to you be able to I identify the trees based on physical characteristics. So I know a lot of people would like to go, be able to, to locate these resistant ash ahead of time. Obviously you wouldn't want to cut those. Um, but it, it may not be possible just based on the physical characteristics of, of the tree. And, and I'm not as up to date on this either. So if anyone has any other uh, information on this, please share it in the, in the chat pod because it'll be interesting to hear about that. What I would say is that in a post infestation area then, after you have mortality, if you, or if you are in an area where you've experienced ash mortality, but you have some sur survivors, these resistant trees are obviously um, a great potential um, to collect the seed you know, from these resistant trees to use this for um, future regeneration. So even thinking maybe ab about some direct seeding or planting. Um, and this is, uh, where the Asian, that Asian ash, that Manchurian ash comes in again, is that there are some, I, I think we're on the sort of the forefront of doing some genetic breeding between these resistant ash and these, these Asian ashes that are naturally resistant. Um, again, to have perhaps a future seed source for ash in our forests. So I just wanna leave you with one final thought. Um, bringing it back down to reality. Uh, I feel like every time I give one of these talks, it's, it's like doom and gloom because we have so many forest health threats. Um, but again, just wanting you to think sort of about long-term forest management and perhaps a man putting emerald ash borer into context. So I took this picture in the, in the Allegheny National Forest. And obviously on the left side, we have a white ash tree, very nice big, right now healthy white ash tree. Uh, on the right, we have an eastern hemlock. So my question was, when I, to myself at least, was you know, when I come back, I wonder which one of these will still be standing given um, the potential for the hemlock woolly adelgid to come in as well. And then I did think about, you know, okay, if there is an, if we do have an infestation and, and mortality, what's the, what's the future of the forest? And then you look down, and it's all of this competing fern. So again, it's sort of just a little reminder that when we're thinking about forest management, we have to always be proactive, always be thinking ahead, always be thinking about what's in that understory, what's the potential if you do have mortality or if you do salvage, what is the potential for that understory to recover? It's, is, is it going to be something you want or is it going to be something undesirable? And if it's the latter, can you do something ahead of time to treat those un that undesirable vegetation? So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, I have on the screen here a lot of the literature that I cited in, in, the, uh, in the talk, as well as a couple other extra papers um, that focus on the biocontrols, um, spread rates, and, and the insecticides. Uh, so with that, I will wrap it up. Um, and Peter can help me take questions. Uh, and I sh should I stop sharing now or leave this up? I'm not sure. Great job, Kimberly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd say leave it up, and uh, maybe what we can do is, if you're willing, you could send me your presentation as a compressed, as a PDF, if you can compress it. Great. Okay. And then I can put it up on the Forest Connect blog site. 
and people can then go to this, uh, particularly this list of references, um, if they want to do, um, if they want some background information. Right. So, so you, you read my mind and provided. <laughs> so, thank you for doing that. Um, there's been lots of action in the <laughs> chat window. So I will uh, go back to where we get started. And then I, if you want, I'll read you the question. So this is okay. this is the point in time when uh, if people have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat window again, please. So when you click on the message, send it to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see the questions. And then I'll read them off and, and Kimberly can respond. Um, and for those of you on logistics, for those of you who are interested in continuing education credits, You've already requested those when you registered for this webinar. So those will be, I'll send that out. It usually takes me a week to, uh, to download the data. So I have all of your email addresses and I'll send you a, a, an email version of a certificate that you can use for your continuing education credits. So you, you don't need to take any further action on that. Okay, first question is from Jim and he wants to know whether EAB is expected to jump to other species of trees as the population of ash gets too small to sustain yeah. EAB. Yeah, I think the general thinking right now is that it is still very much a host specific um, species so that it would stay primarily on ash. Uh, but those things can change. <laughs> and as we, as I mentioned, you know, it has been cited on at least another, at least one more species. So I would say that um, it's within the realm of possibility that it could move to another species. I'm, I, I don't want to give specifics because I'm not sure what that would be. But, but right now, I think the major concern is still really just on the ash. Is there... Yeah. Has there been evidence that it's been hitting other species? Just this white fringe tree. That's the only thing I saw. And I do have that citation up there for um, that talks about that particular species as a novel host. And so I think that probably the, the place to look was, would be more in these urban areas where emerald ash, particularly in you know the, the Michigan area where emerald ash borer has been, um, been around for a while is to look at what what it's doing there because that would probably be a good predictor of, of some future potential um, all right neat I hadn't heard that <laughs> okay um, Eli Roberts hi Eli says uh, even age regeneration treatments are likely to favor ash seedlings um, are there particular <laughs> strategies to avoid this or is it a problem <laughs> that was uh, supplemented by Colin Miller, who's noted that he's seen this as a very good seed year for ash. Yeah, me too. I've seen a lot of ash seedlings this year. And, and I think, you know, as I pointed out at the end of the presentation, is that I wouldn't give up hope on ash seedlings, but I certainly would try to favor, or not favor, but encourage a diversity of other regeneration. So don't bank on just, you know, the ash seedlings. And so, I hate to say get rid of some of the ash seedlings, <laughs> but you know it might be it might be beneficial to think about having a diverse regeneration. And if you do have significant ash component, perhaps think about or ash regeneration component. Think about that might be a good time to think about underplanting of some other species, um, some other natural um, or native uh, trees in the area. Um, or to do some other techniques perhaps to to favor some of the the regeneration of the other species so that so that you have a mix okay so how did how did deer play into that do you think so I mean where I see you know looking at seedling regeneration if you can control deer and these would be in we've done research with small exclosures and doing yeah. some work with largers if you can control the deer and you've controlled competing vegetation, then you're going to get a mix of species. So, uh -huh. so you might have a lot of ash, but you would also at least retain those other species. But right. If you have too many deer, and especially if deer are browsing preferentially on things other than ash. Uh huh. Ash. I mean, 
our our dear New York deer like ash plenty well. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think our Pennsylvania deer like <laughs> right. So, how, I mean, so that was I guess that was one thing that I didn't really see so much in this. You know, when you're thinking about doing you talk a lot about regeneration cuts, mm -hmm. you can do a regeneration cut, but if you don't control the impacts of deer, then you may like yes. your last your last slide showed you may end up with ferns and beech. Right. That's true. I actually, I, I took that out because <laughs> I actually had a slide that showed deer fencing and the importance of doing understory vegetation management in addition to just sort of the regeneration method. And deer is definitely part of that mix too, to, to do deer, con some deer control. Um, okay. Yeah. So John Zalestra, uh, if you're still on, you may want to Resend your question. I mean, it says something about treatment costs per tree to discuss with landowners. Oh, okay. So I, this, that, that that maybe was in about the time that you were talking about this, the cost calculators that are available. Yeah. So this is probably I, I imagine it's in terms of re in reference to the insecticide costs and and treating the trees. And I can give you some general numbers. Like, uh, I mean, it can, it'll cost anywhere between two two hundred to $500 per tree, depending on the size of the tree, to do an individual insecticide treatment. So it is pretty costly, particularly for the stem injections. The, the soil drenches, that's a fairly easy product to buy, but the stem injections, which are really the recommended insecticide treatments, um, it, the range varies. It'll vary by the size of the tree, but if you're talking about like a 12 to 15 inch tree, you're easily in the 300 to 400 dollar range. Um, and again, there are a couple calculators on the web out there that that can provide actually some some other estimates too. If you're working with a multiple uh, range of tree sizes, so that Purdue web uh, or Purdue calculator that I mentioned um, will actually calculate up to I think they said like a thousand trees or something, so hmm. you can get a pretty good estimate. Okay, from Mike Rickenbach. Hi, Mike in Minnesota. He says black ash, and this is just an observation. Uh -huh. um, black ash and bur oak will often be on the same site. Bur oak was not selected in the study you referenced. It's native and an option that landowners are using mm. and planting pre EAB. Uh, he says that white oak is not native to much of the area where black ash grows. Yeah, so that's I'm not sure why the bur oak wasn't selected. That would have been useful to have a comparable oak that's native. Mm -hmm. The swamp white oak was one of those climate adapters, so they picked something that that purposefully was not in the area yet, but that grows to the south. That perhaps you know as climate changes would would range into the into the minnesota area in the future and so that's why they selected that white the swamp white oak mm -hmm. okay uh another kimberly different kimberly says have the wasps wa wasps been released on the known edge of the eab spread um She's looking at, say, since recently found oh, at the yeah. state park in Nebraska. That's right. And then releasing it. Yeah. So is that, I, I mean, so, so looking at looking at the wasps, yeah. kind of like before EAB gets into an area rather yeah. than and after EAB is, is well established. Okay. Well, you do actually have to have some emerald ash borer um, to sustain the, the population of the wasps. So it's usually, it could, it could be on sort of the edge where there is, you know, just that initial infestation. Um, if I recall, I don't remember the, the releases actually being much to the west, like in the Nebraska area. It's mostly been in the northeast side. And I'm trying to find, there was a paper that actually had a map of all the locations of the releases. Um, let me see if I can look through my literature cited so I have a specific recommendation for you. Uh, oh, I, it's this, uh, where is it? Do I have it in there? Oh, yes, here it is. It's the one Dwan et al. from 2018. It says progress and challenges using biological controls. Um, and they actually have a nice set of maps that shows where the releases have been for all of the four species that I showed on the, on that particular uh, PowerPoint slide. Mm 
Okay. Uh, so have resistant tree have resistant trees been found in all species of ash? Oh, that I'm actually not sure about. I for sure with white ash um, and the green ash, I believe, but I am not positive actually on the black ash um, and some of the other ashes. Now, interestingly, I just learned this. There is a blue ash. I didn't even know there was such a thing as blue ash. It's more in the Midwest, I believe, and that mm -hmm. actually is a North American ash, and it seems to be less or yeah, more resistant to the emerald ash borer than our, our white and our greens. Um, but that's about as far as I know. <laughs> okay. yeah. Lisa McGill says, as a private landowner, how do I find a forester to work on managing the woods? It's a bit overwhelming uh -huh. and sad to think about cutting down my ash trees. Yeah, it is actually kind of sad. And I would say uh, my, my recommendations always for private um, landowners is um, in some states, you can work with your, like a service forester who's with the a state forest agency. I don't, do they have a similar thing in New York? Yes. Uh, okay. They will actually help you. They can give you a little bit of preliminary guidance. Um, uh, but then your next step is really to find a consulting forester who can help you actually make a, rec a recommendation in terms of, as I was saying, you know, do you do a timber stand improvement, a thinning or, or a regeneration method? Uh, I know the uh, Association for Consulting Foresters has a website um, with all of their certified foresters on that website. Um, and a good, another good option too is to, to find a forest landowner association in your area and get recommendations from them too in terms of some, some good consulting foresters to work with. I don't, Peter, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, perfect. No, I think you, <laughs> you covered it all. I mean, the one thing I would add is, you know, New York and Pennsylvania and other states have yeah. trained volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, they go by different names, but they are accessible through the cooperative extension system. And many of these are, these are landowners who have oftentimes worked with uh, foresters and so they would know they won't know all of the foresters but they can essentially start in, in that initial process of collecting a whole bunch of names of foresters and then going through a uh, interviewing uh, filtering process to find one that you are comfortable working with so so yeah all right um, Jeff Crick says do ash stump sprouts do ash stump sprout and if they get past the deer, is there any evidence these sprouts will be more likely to survive even uh -huh. than a small seedling? I, so in my experience, I don't see stump sprouting as being a major factor for ash. I don't know if you have any other experience, Peter. I don't really see it that often. Like you, you would see with red maple or, or some other hardwoods. I imagine it does stump sprout, but primarily I see the regeneration coming from the seedlings. Um, so I, ash does stump sprout. Right. Um, yeah. And then the deer, at least here, Deer then eat all of them, so I don't. Yeah. Know. So, so they're. Yeah. Uh, so, are they going to be likely to survive EAB? I don't know. Um, I yeah. would. Think, I would. I mean, it's going to be the same genetics as the original tree, so there's no reason right. to think that there's yeah. going to be anything about the sprouts that would make them more likely to survive. Yeah. Now, they so a lot of with most hardwoods, the sprouts do grow f a little bit faster than seedlings, but that's. Um, <laughs> so, I mean. In terms of maybe if you can do some deer control, you could get them into a higher height class. But I'm not sure that would have a. I don't think there would be any difference in the impact with the emerald ash borer. Okay, Lou Ward. Hi, Lou. Wants to know how um, Manchurian ash uh, fits uh, into it. In what ecological niche yeah. is it? A similar tree for timber. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, I think you mentioned that first when you were showing a picture of black ash, and so I was thinking about basket making. Uh -huh. So from an ecological and a and a utilitarian sense, what's what? what yeah. can you tell us about this species. I think. Well, <laughs> I'll, 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 
start with my personal caveat is that I, I try not to rec recommend non-native species <laughs> as a, for underplanting, but but I think that is in terms of the Asian ashes that are out there, it's the closest fit to what would be a replacement for our current ash in terms of, I, I think more on the utilitarian side, um, in terms of the type of the wood, the wood properties that it, uh, that it has. Um, and in terms of the ecological niche part, I think it's just the, the purpose it really serves is sort of just in terms of being a, a similar seed source for, you know, and a food source for, for wildlife. Uh, it's so, probably so, still so, so the priority is that, it, that it's seemingly resistant at some level to right. eat and, and less about some of these other other, yeah. not, they're not trying to match the characteristics per se. Right, yeah. Just that you have, you know, a, another kind of ash that could fit into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Marjorie Pullman, hi Marjorie, says, wants to know if this presentation will be downloaded or to YouTube. Yes, it will be. So that's, I've been recording it and I'll download that and uh, put it up to YouTube. Colin Miller says, um, forest health folks in New Hampshire dealing with EAB have suggested removing all ash down to four inches, thinking that in 50 years that four inch tree and new cohorts will have a fighting chance due to the anticipated success of biocontrols. Is that the conventional thought in your knowledge of how other states are handling it? Yeah, I'm actually not sure how other states are handling it. I know in Pennsylvania, particularly on the larger um, the state forest lands and national forests, is that they aren't retaining those small trees. They are trying to encourage regeneration, but but I don't think we're at a point where even a four-inch tree, um, even with biocontrols, um, I think, you know, there's a little bit of a time lag in terms of introducing those biocontrols and then how effective they are in, in controlling an entire invasive insect population. Um, that's, I mean, I very, know very generally about what's going on at least in Pennsylvania. So uh, I think unless you have a well-established population of the biocontrol already in the area, then it might you you might be fine with leaving some of those four inch trees, but I do think you have to have that sort of document documented success of those biocontrols. And this is coming from a silv silviculturist so to keep in mind. So, <laughs> okay, Brian Lockhart says the white and I was thinking this was the case. Yes, confirmed that the white fringe yep. trees okay. in the Oleaceae family. I, I, I want to say is it. Kind of, well, whatever the genus is, but it's, so I was thinking it was the same family as the Braxinus is in. Uh huh. So, yeah, so that would make that, that's actually that makes sense then in terms of why that might be another host species. Right. Yep. Um, Carl s suggests or shows the, <laughs> you know, the equalization of biodiversity and sustainability and wants to know your uh -huh. Yeah, I, th I get this question with every webinar I do yeah. <laughs> from various people. And I, I do, I, I mean, I think as a general rule of thumb, particular, particularly when you're dealing with multiple forest health threats, it, threats and particularly species that are host specific, that having a diversity of species in your forest um, is going to be useful in the future for at least retaining some species as things change. And um, again, I always like to point out, you know, there are a lot of aspen stands that are pure aspen clonal stands that are, are not diverse in bio, or at least tree diversity that are very functional. But um, thinking again, you know, on the in the landscape level that that species composition is, that biodiversity of species composition is important. Okay, so there's a couple of questions that refer to whether or not the wasps, the biocontrol wasps, are available to everyone, and are they cheap? Um, I think the first answer is, I think some of the earlier um, species that have been tested may 
be available to the public on a limited scale? You might have to follow up with somebody with the U.S. Forest Service and <laughs> provide a more definitive answer at the, at the nighttime webinar. For the most part, I think they are being released more by sort of uh, state and federal agencies rather than being available for the general public. Um, I know on the expense, on the cost side that they aren't cheap, so sort of just like doing insecticide treatments that it's a, probably going to be a significant investment to do this. Okay, which is what somebody else said that, okay. they're, <laughs> that they're not they're not cheap. Enough, yeah. Um. So Mike Rickenbach says we have sixteen or seventeen species of ash in the U.S., which is a lot more than what I knew of. Mm -hmm. um, one that he's interested in learning about is Fraxinus monophylla, single leaf ash. Mm -hmm. Found the Intermountain West and dominant species in Utah. Does EAB affect the species? Um, he assumes so. So, do, do you know of? I'd never heard of Fraxinus monophyllus. Yeah, I'm I not, know. I... <laughs> I'm not going to venture a guess other than to say it probably does. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know my Western species as well as I should, unfortunately. I, I, that would be my guess as well. Is that? Um, it's still a North American species, but you know, like I was saying, the blue ash seems to be more resistant than our other, some of our a other ashes. So it, it there, I think that there is that possibility that perhaps it's a little more resistant than some other species. Um, it would be interesting. I I haven't seen any research on this that has really looked t tested other ashes out west because obviously it is moving in that direction. But I think the answer is. Uh, right now, probably, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Colin Miller wants to know about the status of ash seed preservation, he says, in New York. Okay. Um, so maybe, uh, which I don't know a lot about, but do you know of any, you want to comment more generally or about what's going on in Pennsylvania? I would say just more generally, I know that there are some organizations that are doing collection of seed, um, and I think they're more on the, like the NGO sort of um, conservation groups that have been doing some of this. And I do think it is throughout sort of the Midwest and Northeast. So I don't know if that's moved into New York yet, or they're focusing on I think they're focusing primarily on the areas where there has been significant mortality already, so they know exactly where those um, those uh, resistant trees are. So. Mm -hmm. in the, I'd say about the same, I don't know a lot, but about the same thing in New York mm -hmm. is that um, it's something like the Mid-Atlantic Seed, it had an acronym that wasn't you couldn't really do a word out of it, but it, there's there's a group, and as I recall, it was an, an NGO kind of group with support maybe by the Forest Service, and uh, they were looking to do collections, you know, very large-scale collections, not just of, of ash trees, but also of a lot of other different species. So there are, there are efforts, but I couldn't talk uh, at length about the details of them. Okay, Mike again says, I have just uh, he's discussed establishing outlier plantations for seed for black ash. Seed collection is great, but the seed remains viable for only about 20 years. Um, he just returned from a trip in Ontario where he saw black ash growing 150 to 200 miles north of Thunder Bay and wonders if anyone else is thinking about outlier plantation, yeah. which he means to defining outlier plantations as uh, plantings done away from roadways in north of the current EAB invasion. Huh. Yeah, I don't, I, I think the whole, even under planting in general, or, you know, this outlier planting is pretty, um, hasn't been done all that much. So I'm, I'm not sure. That is sort of a interesting ideas. Um, you know, this other study I talked about was where there was already some ash mortality, but thinking about this is again you know getting ahead and pre-planning is to, to do some of that maybe planting outside of the the current eab range mm -hmm. but i don't think it's yeah it's it's not it's an, I, it's a neat idea i mean if, yeah. if you're uh, you know if you're within the range of of the of the tree species there's no reason to think it wouldn't establish right. and in, in terms of you know a seed orchard that's a um seems like it'd be 
could be very productive yeah. and beneficial in the long run. So, all right. Well, Kimberly, that's all of our questions. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, let me turn off the recording. Stop recording.